All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Serious Angler podcast, powered by our friends over X2 Power Batteries. We're back with the captain, Mr. Andy Full, and I'm your host, Bailey Eigbrett. We're back from the classic. Andy, I think, first things first, got to congratulate our boy, Mr. Justin Hamner. Oh, man. Bassmaster Classic champ, uh, fellow X2 Power Pro team member, and we, I don't know if you guys saw on social media, we had Hamner on the show last week. And he called and the it. Dude straight up called a shot. Granted, he called a shot on like seven other podcasts that, yeah. for whatever reason, had some intuitive feeling that Hamner was going to pull it out last uh, yeah. last week. But uh, the man called a shot. So I got to give him props. And it was just cool to see. And I've, I've had these, the conversation over Classic Weekend with so many people, um, which, by the way, is my absolute favorite part. I was talking about that with a few people. Is it's like a big family reunion every year because yeah. being in the north, we don't get to see many people from the industry, and um, there's just so many people um, you're, you're going through that are participating. Like our guest today, uh, Adam Rasmussen, it's like, man, I would love to see that guy win. Whether it's just a really cool story, or you have a personal connection, or you, th- or it's guys like Polinick or Hackney that just have been around the the industry and in, in the league so long that you're like, man, like I think everybody'd be happy for that guy if they yeah. won. And it was just, it, it's it's hard to like hear from one guy because then you're also like, man, I really would like to see that guy when you wish uh, the guys could all could all know that they're gonna they're gonna earn one one day. But um, nonetheless, the you heard Mercer last year talk about with Gussie, you know, the the good guys won, you know, with with Gussie winning, and uh, I think we could bucket that the same with, with Hamner Hamner winning this one. Super cool, and dude, the emotion, the uh, the raw emotion from him afterwards. You know, talking about the story. Um, if you guys haven't seen, uh, scroll through some of the Bassmaster press conference stuff with with Hamner. Definitely advise you to do that because it's if you want to see raw passion. That's it was on display when he was talking about how he was literally scra- uh, scraping for coins in his truck truck bed, trying to buy food to get home, which is it tells you what these guys put on the line to try to make a dream come true. And, Everyone uh, thinks it's easy to get there. It is by far not like no, no. <laughs> which is why it's freaking sick. Our guest today, Adam Rasmussen, uh, coming from the opens, you know, being a, a salmon multi-species guide up up north in Wisconsin, basically almost winning the whole dang thing. I mean, one, yeah. I mean, if you hear people see uh, say like, you know, that people always remember the winners, but I think people are going to remember second place for a long time in this one. Being the fact that there's a quite a large gap between second and third place, yeah. uh, and I'm waiting on a text back here from Ken Duke. On, I think there's been one or two guys that have won the classic when they're not an elite series pro, but they've been like already qualified for the elites going into, but uh, haven't qualified for that classic through an open and have won it. I believe one of them was actually Boyd Duckett, um, but. Uh, I think this performance, dude, I, I love the underdog story going into this. So we're going to get Adam here, uh, Adam on here in, in a little bit. But also later on the show, uh, we have the 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 Bassmaster Kayak Champ, Drew Gregory, our pal, coming on here as well. Uh, Drew adding to his uh, list of accolades. I don't think there's been a single thing in the sport of kayak fishing that he hasn't won yet. I think with now uh, having won the championship. Oh, God. Um, like I, it's pretty unreal. impressive. Yeah. Unreal. <laughs> which drew also being on the x2 power squad and then also dude shout out to tyler Corey uh and scott sledge on team uh the montevallo college team also running x2 so x2 basically owned classic Swept the weekend team. that's fantastic right. uh on the dub and we're actually getting those two boys uh on the show next tuesday so we're gonna have them on talk about the uh the college event as well but uh man it was it was such a fun weekend getting to to see everybody and um classic week one because of the expo and seeing everybody seeing things that are new getting to walk around and hang out with people that you don't normally uh get to hang out with um man it's seeing being able to i'm very fortunate in the fact of my my gig that i get to see behind the scenes but also can go and see what the fans see and see just the the true emotion through these guys and like obviously being an angler and seeing being able to 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 correlate and and connect like with those guys like and understand um you know having that that dream that passion it was it's it's my favorite weekend 
of the year when it comes to bass fishing, man. Just for that, that alone. There's yeah. nothing like the classic, the expo, everything leading up to it. I mean, I'm sad that I didn't unfortunately make it over this past weekend, but I'm not missing Ray Roberts. So I can't wait to get to Texas. We might have to do like a two week thing and take the boat down and go fish. Oh, buddy, I think we got some uh, some plans already in place for Texas. <laughs> That's going to be a lot of fun because oh, yeah. with next year, I got to fish that the kayak championship. Oh, uh, I don't know where the heck right. you got to go be, early, but, uh, but I will say there's already a house in place and we have some people that we're going to be hanging out with and uh, potentially for our fantasy fishing crew that uh, tune into this show. We're thinking about getting the full squad down next year for a little in-person round table. Oh, that'd uh, be so Mac fun. talking fantasy fishing show in person next week. We got to find a barbecue awesome. joint close to Ray Roberts that allows us to do it there and just have some barbecue. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Texas and, and barbecue. I don't think there's any joints around there. We can find it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, no, we were our 100% going to make this thing happen. Uh, we're going to get the boys down there and uh, it's going to be a good time, but. Uh, that's a whole year away. I want to talk about this past weekend and because I love this underdog story. Uh, and so without further ado, let's bring him on here. Mr. Adam Rasmussen. What's going on, man? Oh, not much. How are you boys? Warming up finally. <laughs> yeah. As uh, you know. <laughs> as I told you a little bit, Adam, offline, um, I got back yesterday and, of course, <laughs> "Quote unquote," nursing the the classic hangover and going back to work, whereas your classic hangover might have been a little more painful than mine. But at least you were out fishing. It sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, right now. I'm hanging out on Table Rock Lake, and it's cold down here. Uh, today it got up to like 42 or something like that. Oh. But we got the whitewater torque vest on, staying warm, sitting outside. Uh, my whole family's inside. We rented a house. Kids are on spring break. So we'll sit out here where it's cold. And, and yeah. So are the, are the kids cool with the spring break on Table Rock? Or were they asking for the whole Mexico Southern trip? Uh, they wanted to go, obviously, to Florida. That's where they always want to go. And I'm like, we are not driving to Florida after the Classic we thought about texas and i'm like nope we're not doing texas either i'm not driving further from home uh so we uh we we conned them into branson so that's a lot to work <laughs> well let's go fishing in 40 degree weather instead kids <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love it now your kids like fishing too i'm i'm hoping yeah yep. awesome. well and here's a the question then for are they on the bass kick or for, for people that may not know, like you're a multi-species guy. So, and and I was actually joking with the the folks at Johnson outdoors. I'm like, man, we're like, we're not trying to jinx him, but like if he does win, how funny it would be if he went up on stage and be like, this bass fishing stuff is easy. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so are they on the bass kick or do they have a different species they prefer? They're on the whatever's biting kick. That's like awesome. most kids are. So good, which is fine. I don't push them into anything. That's how it should be, though. When you're, especially yeah. when you're going up and uh, before you choose a lane. I mean, even still to today, I feel like the 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 fish heads are the people that that got it dialed in, or at least that fish pretty free anyway. Right. Well, so dude, uh, first classic, uh, and I'd say beyond winning the damn thing, you d you did the best you could <laughs> beyond actually. Uh, winning the event so like coming away from it have you had any time i'm sure you said you, you know your phone's ringing off the hook and again appreciate you taking the time to to come on here but uh, have you been had any moments to think about the classic and emotions from it things you took away uh not really i know uh just to be flat out honest when i when hammer brought his fish up and i pretty much already knew that he was going to have me. Um, we talked a little bit before, but uh, when he won and I went backstage, like I was royally pissed off for a little while just because you're right there and I lost a good one. I didn't see it. I set the hook on it. Like I've caught enough of them. I'm like, this one's a giant and uh, 
they rolled across the stump and broke my line and so maybe that was the one i don't know but you know what it was his time congrats to him i'll be back someday we'll have another crack at it so i've kind of got to the point now where i'm just i'm content with second like i think uh what i've heard from people like the fans like i almost feel like i want it taking second just from what my situation is um sounds like people around the world are pretty jacked right now for me yeah, yeah. the uh the underdog from wisconsin that got through with a, an open and almost won the whole damn thing beating some of the biggest names in the sport i mean that's you should be damn proud dude like I, i'm sure there's been an outpouring of support for you anyways. yeah that's there's, the kind of stuff you need to roll it into uh the career in bass fishing man especially chasing that elite dream you got to have people behind you you know family friends fans <laughs> your sponsors like they're all so important to me because there's no way that I would be sitting here right now if I didn't have them. 100%, man. And I, I can say from the backside of things, obviously, I don't think anyone was upset that Hamner won. I think everybody's happy for him. But at the end of the day, it was, I'll tell you, in the J.O. booth, of course, they were they were rooting for you. But like some of the Midwest boys, like from Wired to Fish and guys that know you that are closer to home, they were they were all checking. They were like eyeing their phones like, <laughs> Where's Adam at? How's he doing? And like, he's, I think they were like, like, man, how crazy of a party would it be if Adam if Adam won Sunday night? Oh my gosh! Oh, it would have been a party. <laughs> we, there is a party regardless, but it would have been. Uh, yeah, I probably still wouldn't be awake from then. So <laughs> <laughs> it said, "Here goes three hundred k right to the party." Let's, let's right. Yeah. Well, so. I think it was a. Uh, one of the best stage speeches I ever heard was, uh, I think it was Maddie Robertson, where he's like, I think Mercer asked him on stage, like, if he was to win. Uh, and he goes, and like the winnings, he goes, I probably spent it all the whole night. And he goes, uh, he goes, would you move out of the trailer park? He goes, no, I'll just buy the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty smart business move on his behalf because then he's getting <laughs> all that rent payment, right? So he's making yeah. some money back. Yeah. For sure. Well, so dude, you're you're chasing the elite dream through the opens, and so you don't get a, you don't get a lot of time per se to to spend time with the guys at least that are on the elites currently. And I guess with that, I, I'm kind of curious if you have any stories that you're able to tell or any takeaways from any of the guys you might have met that you might have had like a different point of view leaving the classic before you'd actually met them or spent time with them. Uh, so we had the night of champions dinner. Like, I know a couple of the guys from the elites, not a lot of them. I uh, haven't hung out with them that much. But we went to that dinner. I and mean, up until that time, like, I was, like, pretty nervous, you know. I mean, you're fishing around people that I've looked up to for a long time. And uh, so we went to the Night of Champions dinner. And then after that, like, we're all chit chatting on the bus ride back, went to the bar. Uh, then you just realize that, dude, they're all the same as me. They love to catch bass. They like to have some cocktails and they all want to have fun like that. They're all the same people, you know? So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Just to have that state of mind, like going into the tournament, like we're all here for the same reason. We're all the same people. We just want to go have fun, catch a bunch of big bass, and hopefully win a derby. That's awesome, dude. That probably helped maybe ease the nerves a little bit, especially rolling into blast off day one where nerves could be an all-time high. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like you look around and I'm like, well, I hung out with most of these guys a couple nights ago. So like <laughs> let's go have some fun. Let's get this done. Some of these guys were way drunker than I I was, so I could probably beat these guys today. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we're going to get into the specific event here in a little bit, but I actually have an update here from Ken Duke. So <laughs> there was Brian Kirchel was one that won the Bassmaster Classic after qualifying through the nation. Um, and it was correct that Boyd was the last to win after qualifying 
through the opens, but technically was on the elites that coming year. Um, but something for you that maybe will help ease this thing a little bit on coming in second. There was a guy named Dalton Bobo that qualified through the nation and finished second in 1997 to Dion Hibden, losing by one ounce, and he Ooh. had a dead fish penalty that day. Ooh. Yeah, his story's a lot better than mine. Ouch. That hurt. That hurts. That hurts bad. <laughs> I think in that situation, that would hurt a lot more. Yeah, I mean, I it would have been way worse if it was ounces, but you know, it was two pounds, ten ounces. Like I had my chances. It it was what it was. It could have been way worse. Um, like I said, I'm happy for Hamner. Like I believe when it's your time, it's your time. even though like some crazy stuff happened that final day to me, I actually thought like, I thought I pulled it off. Did it, did it pop up in your brain a couple times where you're just like trying to shut it down quick? Like any feeling of like, this might be it. Like trying to, it was, it's just kind of weird. Like I had the same feeling at Wheeler Lake and the same one at Eufaula. Like you just do weird stuff and get a bite. Um, it's like, the final day, I just catch them all in, you know, brush piles in like eight to twelve foot of water, and uh, catch them all on a jig, and I just caught like a four and a half pounder, and I'm like looking for another pile, and I turn my trolling motor and looked up on this rock point. and I could see a couple fish on Mega Live, and I just for whatever reason, they were sitting on just a tiny little pile. I set my jig down, picked up a spinner bait, winged my spinner bait over there, caught a three and a half, put it in live ball, put my spinner bait down, picked my jig up, went back out, next pile, caught another one. My camera guy's like, what just happened? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you put your jig down and picked up a spinner bait. Wow. I, just, I blacked I did out it. for a moment. <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea, no idea why, like things like that were happening. And then like in the morning too, like my plan was not to go to where I started until the afternoon. And like something told me like, turn around and go there. And uh, yeah, man, if I wouldn't have started there, I might've came in with a zero. I don't know. Cause it was pretty grindy everywhere else it ended up. So hmm. just weird stuff like that happened. Yeah. Just from watching live, it seemed like the bike got really tough after like 11 o'clock for most people. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, she was pretty much non-existent for me after 11. I think I caught like seven more bass and they're all like two to two sixties. I never called yeah, again. I can... I can say that uh, I was in well, was in the media room around 1230 to 1-ish with um, a few of the J.O. guys, Wired to Fish Boys, and we'd seen the last update you had was like 1030. And I think Hamner's was maybe around 11-ish. And we just kept scrolling and refreshing. Like, just, just maybe we're like, there's no way that no one's caught anything yet. Like, the whole top four, like, nobody caught anything past 11 o'clock. And we're this like, thing's no broken. Way. Yeah, that's what we thought. <laughs> we straight yeah, up just I've, it refresh. I watched quite a bit of live on the final day, and I think the only one who found a consistent bite in the afternoon was Coop Thanks. Galat. He found a really good bite, like fast and furious, but he had like nothing, and then he caught like seven or eight in a row, and then nothing after that. Mm. Yeah, I All saw with like 30 pocket. minutes left, Hank caught like two, three pounders back to back. Yeah. And that was maybe it. But, um, Real fast, we do have a, a cool story here. Um, last year, I like to talk about Dave Mullins um, waiting around for Gussie, even though he he sucked, you know, on that day. Wait around for Gussie to run back in so that he, Gussie can make sure he got his fish back. There's a comment here that says about uh, uh, Drew Cook had a pretty rough bonehead oopsie on day one where he had about 18 pounds, came in five minutes late. So Ooh. kind of a rough you know like we're talking about kicking yourself after a tournament that's one i'm sure that's going to sting for him for a little bit 
Uh, Hamner said that they were in the, well, he was in the same area as Hamner. And Hamner said that after that, Cook let him have that creek the second day. Pretty classy move right there. Yeah, that's the stuff that yeah. you don't hear about that are mad respect to a, a guy's character anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, like the final day, uh, I travel with J.H. Kurt, so it's maybe a little different, but he's like, dude, you have a legit chance. Like, we're both fishing the same creek. He's like, you can have it all. I'll go somewhere else. Hell yeah. Which is, uh, that's pretty awesome on his part. But I do the same thing for him too, like. Yeah, I feel I mean, like all anglers would for for the most part. The majority of these guys would when they understand the circumstance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um so one of the things we talked about on our original show a while back was being a multi-species angler um and how that can help you in the end. So what when if people looked at the weather conditions from one practice but two from day 1 to day 3 of competition it was roller coaster for you guys does any of that factor in like an understanding and being intuitive with multiple different species across different conditions does that any of that help you you think in the end from trying to adjust uh yeah i mean for one like anytime you're fishing you're learning stuff i don't care if i'm out ice fishing i'm still learning stuff that i could put to use somewhere else um you know whether it's getting better at your electronics or whatever the case may be. Uh, so there's, you know, like fishing on the great lakes, we have to deal with so much current and I've learned through salmon fishing, what current does to fish and I've taken it to walleye fishing and bass fishing. And they're all fish, like fish are fish. Mm -hmm. They swim around, they eat food. They go try to find more food. That's all. That's all they do. They swim and eat. Like they got a brain about that big around. Um, so like just through all of my multi-species fishing, like there are definitely things that, you know, I can't explain one right now, but there's stuff that I've learned throughout my life that I take down south and, and put to use. It's just on, you know, fish behavior and, and how they act. Well, and speaking of adjustment, what was your approach to that practice period? Because there's a lot of time, especially this time of year, uh, you know, moving into the heat of spring, going up to spawn where a lot can change very fast. So how, was that top of mind going through practice or what was that experience like? Uh, I mean, you, you kind of know that going into it, that what you find Friday, Saturday or Sunday it's probably not going to be there by day one of the tournament. Um, but I got a bunch of fish, you know, a bunch of bites. Um, normally I wouldn't set the hook on them, but I'm like sitting out there on Friday. I'm like, we don't fish for seven days. Like I'm jacking every one of these things. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, caught a bunch of fish got a feel for what they were doing. Um, and I just try like, so you know where they're at now, you have an idea where they're going to go. And I just looked for as much stuff as I could around the lake. And, you know, I kind of, I fished around. So I fished, I fished the areas of the lake that I caught the best size of fish during practice and then just adapted. So then on like Wednesday, our last practice day, I just went and screwed off. Like I didn't go anywhere near where I planned on fishing. Tried to find maybe another another spot or two. Uh, didn't didn't really catch much that day, but I knew things were gonna change. And I just went into the area that I felt most comfortable and fished around until I got that one bite that clued me in. And then once that happened, then it was like another clue, another clue dialed. And then the next day, throw everything from day one out and start over again. <laughs> and same Love thing it. on the third day, like every day it changed. I had to completely start over. What were the two biggest changes on day two and day three? 
compared to day one? Uh, so day one was, it was like in the upper 50s when I woke up. Uh, sun, sun came out in the afternoon. Day two, it was 37 degrees when I woke up. Cloudy, overcast. Sun didn't pop out until like noon. Uh, that's I didn't catch any fish day one and two until the afternoon. Uh, once that sun came out, it got them fired up. But then day three, you know, it was a warmer night. It was, uh, you know, maybe 50 in the morning, but we had all that wind that was forecasted, clouds. Uh, so three totally different days. You know, when you have a cold night versus a warm night, that definitely affects the fish in the springtime. Plus, the water was falling. Uh, at some point during the tournament, started coming back up, but like changing water levels, and we had a lot of different stuff to uh, to fish against out there. Talk about zero consistency. <laughs> like, yeah, you could you have you had a consistent pattern because you caught them on basically a spinnerbait and a jig the entire time, but everything else around you was like a revolving door, constant change. Yeah, it was like you just had to take. Those techniques and just adjust them a little, like shallower, deeper, you know. But that's before I got there, I'm like, I'm going to go catch them on a spinnerbait and a jig. I don't want to lose any, you know, and those are your best odds for getting everyone in the boat. I don't want something with treble hooks on it. Like, you know, I did catch a couple on a jerkbait the first day, but uh, if I can get them. To eat something with a single hook, I am going that direction 100%. <laughs> yeah, a little less stress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, we got a question here from Bass Fanatic that's asking, how much did it drop, the, the water level? Uh, so, like, I looked on the website. I don't even remember 100% what it said, but it seemed to drop a lot more than what that said. There was a day one of practice. I was fishing in a pocket. Day two, I went in the same pocket. And I looked over and there's like a brush pile sticking like four or five inches out of the water. And I'm like, man, I don't remember seeing that yesterday. Third day, I just drove by the pocket to look at that brush pile. It's sticking out like eight inches. And then Wednesday, I drove by there again just to, because that's like what I was judging everything off of because I'd seen it every day. And the thing's sticking out like two feet. Oh, and then uh, I think it was later on day two, it, the water was higher on it. So, but it had dropped, a, you know, a couple feet and then started coming up. I don't know if like some of that could have been like wind driven. We had a lot of wind the one day when it, it might have pushed water out of the pocket, but uh, yeah, it was definitely changing. Do you think it would have made the bite more consistent then for guys if the water level stayed where it was during practice? If it would have stayed or been rising, I think uh, you would have saw some giant weights coming in. I went there in November and I caught so many five and six, and seven pounders like we didn't see a lot of that this week. So I think maybe that falling water had something to do with it. Well, that's a perfect note for this question we have from David Young saying, uh, do you feel that fishing this classic on Grand will help you with the nation championship? Oh, definitely. I got like 500 brush piles, Mark. <laughs> it's ready to go. <laughs> so when is, when is the nation? Uh it's like the first week in November. Oh, perfect. Perfect timing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right when all, you know, the ruts going on in Wisconsin, there's giant deer running around. I got to go bass fishing. That's okay. I'll take it. Well, I was saying perfect timing because of last November when you went and pre-practiced. Yeah. Yeah, I was there like two weeks later. So, mm, could be so yeah, good. like everything I learned during pre-practice and, yeah, well, uh, I'm excited to go back. Heck yeah, dude. Well, so leading from practice, um, skipped over one day. That I'm actually pretty intrigued 
how it went for you and that was uh media day did you did you get any because there's there's some characters that go to media day that are armed with some mics and phones cam uh, cameras and all that did you get any wacky or off the cuff questions from people uh no not really um I actually only had a few people come by and ask questions. And one was just one word. How do you feel about the classic? You know, I said honored because it truly is an honor to be at that stage. Um, and Luke Lavoric from Johnson Outdoors came by and he's like, what are you going to do if you win $300,000 this week? I'm like, buy lots of booze. We're going to have one big party. <laughs> Love it. Spoken so, like a Midwesterner. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, those were the questions. It's awesome. I don't know if you had a chance to scroll social media. We got to give our, our boy a shout out to, but Cal Patrick probably had the best post coming out of Media Day with a. <laughs> uh, do you know the video I'm talking about? Yeah. The oh, Pat yeah. Renwick, was the Pat Renwick one? Uh, yeah, I think Pat le- let off with it, but it yeah. had like <laughs> Livesey, Polonic, bunch of guys that were just Who's Kyle Patrick, <laughs> <laughs> Hunter Shrike. When he's like, uh, he's like, is he in the elites? Who even is Kyle Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> that, that one was pretty good, but, yeah, it's great. Uh, I like that the media day is becoming a little bit more creative in that regard, but um, yeah, <laughs> we got to, and speaking of question we talked about it a little bit offline now that you're you're taking a sip with the koozie on it uh brayden harris is here in the chat and he's asking about what's your favorite soda sense flavor on derby day so we'll lead with what is soda sense and then two if you got a favorite flavor on derby day uh so soda sense is a company they're out of green bay wisconsin that they make all of the co2 bottles for like your in-home soda machines uh like ninja makes a pretty cool one um there's a bunch of them out there but anyway so they sell the co2 bottles and then they have a refill program so if you go online if you have one at home or you don't you want to get one go check them out at sodasense.com you can sign up for the refill program like they send a a shipping label with it so you put your old ones in the box send them back they refill and send them back to you super simple saves a bunch of time you don't have to go run around town and find somebody that fills CO2. Um, and then favorite flavor. Heck, when I have a bad day on the water, like I'm going to go pour a whiskey and put a little Sprite in it. <laughs> I'm sure the, the wife is, is happy. You got some soda sense, make her own homemade white claws, as you're saying. Yeah. People make white claws and all kinds of stuff with it. It's actually pretty cool. You don't have to go to the store. You don't have to have like 12 packs of soda laying all over the place. If you like soda, or maybe you just want to make uh, something bubbly and throw some fruit juice or strawberry juice or whatever in it. You can kind of make, make whatever you like to the flavor that you like. Yeah. Spice things up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, so dude, um, Obviously, on on the last day, there was definitely some rumbling early on just because, obviously, all of our eyes are peeled to Bass Track. And I think Hamner didn't even have a limit until maybe 10 o'clock. And you were, at one point, half a pound off of Hamner. So everyone's, like, rumbling. Like, are you seeing this? Like, is this, is this going to happen? Uh, so... You know, you mentioned earlier on the stage, like you, you had a feeling when he was pulling up that you already knew the the outcome of everything. So with that, you know, leaving your first classic as the bridesmaid, what are some thoughts you got going into? Obviously, the remaining remainder of the open season was still a shot to make next year's classic and potentially the elite series season. But what does this do for you mentally? Uh, it just tells me that I can do it. I can compete. You know, I have what it takes. I just have to have my mind right and not, I think the biggest thing was 
you know, like we as anglers, a lot of us just get too hung up on practice. Um, you got to keep an open mind and let the fish tell you what they're doing and then run with it. And that's exactly what I did this week. So like I proved to myself that like, Hey dummy, you don't have to have 20 spots. You got bites on like, go get a bite and just know what the lake looks like and go from there. Um, yeah. And honestly, like, so when I won the open, I only got two days of practice. We're allowed four and a half. I wanted to fish a derby in Sturgeon Bay, so I showed up late. Um, Lake Eufaula, it was pouring ass rain the first day that I got there because I came from Florida. I'm like, I'm not sitting in the pouring rain. It's 45 degrees. Like, I did go out for like two hours, and I'm like, this is just miserable. Uh, <laughs> Screw this. So I, I went in. So really I only pre-fished for a day and a half there. And then, you know, this one's just crazy, crazy practice for the classic. Like you can't really rely on a lot of stuff you did during practice. So maybe I should just quit practicing. I don't know. <laughs> it seems to be working for you. Just... Or cut, just cut it down like two and a half days and call it good. <laughs> it always seems to be that way where it's, uh, especially a tournament like that, because the clear of the headspace, he's usually the guy that's willing to make the most uh, adjustments easily, I would say, because, I mean, between you and, and Hamner, Hamner's thing's pretty damn clear. Like, he's just kind of like a free-floating, I'm just going to go wherever type of deal. I mean, we I think we definitely brought that out of him in, in past shows, but um, it definitely seems to be the case, like, when you roll into an event where it's, either something you find at the very last minute or it's minimal practice that he seems to be a, a trend for, for big yeah. events anyways. But yeah, everybody has their own, their own way of going about things. Like, I think I'm just finally trying, finally finding mine. Uh, there's no right or wrong, wrong way to do anything. Like you have to find what works for you. Um, and I learned that through the opens, like, you think that this is the only way that you can catch them. No. Like, if you look at the top 10, every time there's a top 10 cut, all 10 guys are doing something different. Like, you just go out, do what you like to do, catch them how you like to catch them, and then that's when you're going to have success. And I'm finally getting that through my thick head. It's, it's <laughs> paying off. So, yeah. well, I in, the think... la in the last year, like, it's paid off quite a bit. Yeah, and I think that's something good to note, especially uh, one guys at at your stage that are going through the opens, or even guys that are coming up right now that might not have made that jump to the opens just yet, is that the in, in cases it definitely helps to go and train yourself and and maybe in a technique or something that is very regional specific, but for the most part, doing what you quote unquote should be doing. Uh, and in, in a certain lake, sometimes will majority, I should say majority of the time burns you. Whereas you hear yeah. about guys that are successful or like, I don't know, I do this at home. I just went and found an area that I could do it. But yeah, hundred percent. How, how do you teeter with that? Like, is, is there times where you go out and you practice like you're at a uh, table rock right now where you go and you'll try something that you've never done before or try to learn something new? Or are you always that, you know, I'm going to keep what I do my thing. No, like I'm always learning stuff. Um, everywhere I go, like even during practices, like I'll take part of it. Like, you know, I think I can catch them throwing a giant swim bait or whatever, like something I don't do a lot. Like, I think you could maybe catch them on this lake doing that. And I'll mess around with it for a while and like just try to get better at it. Um, you do that a little bit here and there. Like I, I don't have, unfortunately, I have a business at home, family. I don't get to live down south all year and, you know, fish for fun in between tournaments and get better at stuff. Like I have to do it while I'm pre-fishing. You know, I get nine weeks. That's it. Yeah. Um, you know, and a couple of times we get like cases like this where we're just on a vacation, but I don't get a lot of time to 
messed around with stuff like that that you would you would do down south um you know even in wisconsin like i don't go largemouth fishing for fun i don't have a largemouth within i guess there's a few in the bay but i'm not going to go fish for them there's not that many like i'm not going to drive three hours on my day off to go catch a large mouth you know i fish small moths in sturgeon bay right so well with that how do you feel about basically having the midwest open division this year for the opens i'm stoked this is going to be fun i'm looking forward to going to st Clair. i've never been there uh i fished at lacrosse for i did some bfls a long time ago there um lacrosse will be fun leech lake yeah i like it i've been there it's fun lake but 225 guys five days of practice uh three tournament days that lake probably can't handle that i'm just gonna say it can't handle that pressure like uh it doesn't fish that big but who knows we'll see it's probably been it's been a few years since I've been there, but uh, so that one will kind of be a wild card, but I'm stoked for all of them. I don't have to drive that far. That's the cool part. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say it's a good year to uh, be a Midwesterner trying to chase the opens or at least try to uh, uh, cherry pick to make a classic or something like that. But right. It's definitely, uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, it's a whole different gauntlet when you talk about 200, 225 boats versus, 50 for a classic which probably from your case was like was incredible you probably felt like you're back home in a club derb or something like that you can breathe <laughs> yeah. so i was out there during practice i'm like where is everybody like <laughs> yeah. you're looking around like you don't see a boat for hours and you're like i don't know if i'm in like the totally wrong part of the lake or and i'm like oh no like there's 56 boats like you're not gonna see anybody yeah uh, it was great you're sitting Maybe. there like did I find something good or am I just <laughs> lost here? Am yeah, I even right? on the right lake right now? <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, that was that was awesome. Like just to you didn't have to worry about anything during practice. Like when you're in an open practice, you're like, all right, like you might fish around the area and like watch it, and you'll be like, All right, there's I've watched 10 boats come in here in the last three hours like i'm not even gonna fish a tournament here like too many people figured it out or it's uh it's a different deal which is very cool and relaxing yeah it's definitely a nice breath of fresh air that's for sure now yeah. you're back to the opens <laughs> yeah you're gonna yeah. see everybody and their mother on practice <laughs> we got some work to do there too it has not been a good start to the year but uh yeah it's, it's, it's what you in three is it three yeah you can make a lot of hay just win the last six you'll be right yeah well i'll get a couple <laughs> top tens and checks and i think we'll be close we'll yeah. see. start having some like top 20s i'm sure you'll be sitting pretty at the end of the yeah year. you can definitely turn it around yet so yeah well dude um i got one last question for you unless andy's got something but i also have one thing i did notice throughout the uh the tournament coverage with photos and such and i'll have to send it to you afterwards and i'll post it on the serious angler social media because i think it's pretty funny but also kind of cool um was that uh dude i think you got i was talking with uh luke about this i think you got the you got the hackney stink eye going when you're on the water do i <laughs> yeah you kind of like there's one there's one photo of you sending a jig out and you're kind of looking out from under your rain jacket I'm like, dude, he's got the hacky stink eye. Like, he's got that intimidation oh factor. Like, I don't know if I want to see him on the water, man. I'm going to catch him. Look, is what he has. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's definitely some of that going on. But, no, I've never seen it myself. So, you have to send me that picture or put it online. I don't care. Yeah, I'll find it, and I'll find one with a hacky, and I'll, I'll do it side by side. It'll there you be, go. It'll be perfect. <laughs> Love it. Um. But yeah, my question for you, David Jung actually put it in the comments. Um, is there one story that you have from guiding that stands out? Uh, something either funny happening or something yeah. wild that uh, still sticks with you to today? Uh, man, there's a lot of them. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's endless. 
Like oh, I, I can do, use this. I is feel a like good every one. day guiding, there's a new story or multiple that come out. So, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, I don't even care if the guy gets pissed that I say it, whatever. He's probably listening. But, <laughs> so, I had we had like a multi group trip. Uh, we had some guys from Canada down, and those guys drink like unbelievable. So we're out walleye fishing and I've got two of them with me and the one is just trashed. Like twice I had to grab him by his bibs or he was going over the boat. And like, this is April. The water's like 43 degrees. You fall in, like you're probably going to the hospital. You know, we got a 20 minute ride back to the closest ramp. And uh, I told him to sit on, I'm like, sit on in the driver's seat. Like you're done. You're taking a time out. And he's like, oh, blah, 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 whatever. I turn around, he's back, he's found the bottle, and he's sipping off the bottle of Malibu. Like, we have a name for it now. Like, when you get drunk, you get Malibu'd. <laughs> um, <laughs> so oh, then, good. finally, like, it gets quiet. Me and the other guy are up on the bow fishing. Like, it gets quiet, and we turn around. He's passed out. He's sleeping. I'm like, all right, he's good. So uh, about an hour later, you hear a bunch of stumbling around. He's trying to get up, and uh, he's got a full snowmobile suit on. Like, dude, what what are you doing? Go back to bed. Like, don't get up. Stay down. <laughs> he's like, oh, I got a, I got a piss. I got a piss. Uh, never mind. Too late. Like, oh, just no. let her go right in a snowmobile suit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Oof, hey, that's tough cleaning. It, it was, uh, that was, dude, I had so much fun with those guys when they're down fishing. It was like nonstop laughs. And like, that was just a funny story from it. And, <laughs> oh, never mind. But yeah, I mean, they're on vacation, having fun. Like, yeah, it's all good. That's incredible. I, I've, I've got some that like, the people won't ever come back with me. I won't let them back in my boat, but those guys are always welcome in my boat. It's fun. Yeah. I don't know if this is the Matt Thompson that we have had on the show before, but he says, do not play pace cars with Adam. <laughs> yeah. What is pace uh, you should have Matt tell his story about playing pace car with me at the VFW. <laughs> is this the Matt from Minnesota from like the, yeah. from the champions tour? The, yeah. The Yeti. Oh the man, Yeti, Matt. Yeah, that's the freaking dude. <laughs> yeah, get him on here real fast just to tell the story. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We have an Adam Rose session. Oh, <laughs> uh, we were. Uh, uh, me and my buddy Sid came up with it one time. I, I don't even know how we came up with it. It's called pace car. So, like when you're drinking with a buddy at the bar, you have to keep up with the guy that's ahead of you. Otherwise, you lose. You don't get whatever, like you just lose. Like there's nothing behind it, but it's like it's just one of those things. Um, so you got boys that you've been drinking with, you, you, you got everybody understands. Yeah, me and Matt and Mark Quartz were sitting. We were in uh, northern Minnesota for a Champions Tour tournament, and went down to the VFW. They had like a dinner special going on. And uh, sitting at the bar, I hardly know Matt. And I'm like, you ever play pace car? No, what's that? I'm like, you better hurry up. Like, I'm empty. <laughs> and we're going, like, drink for drink. And they finally kicked us out of there. And I'm pretty sure he woke up by a dumpster with the hotel manager oh, something looking for him. <laughs> and he can tell the rest of the story. It gets worse. We'll have to but, uh, to bring on a whole panel because I mean, if you got Quartzy in the mix, then that's definite trouble. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to his defense, like I did uh, fall asleep in my boat for a few hours that afternoon during practice. Like I went on the back deck and took a nap, <laughs> and uh, I was fishing out of a walleye boat at that time. So I'm like laying down by the live wall between the compartments on a bunch of life jackets, and I had a guy come up to me. He's like he's yelling as he pulls up to the boat and I get up and I'm like, what? He's like, oh, I was just making sure like you didn't fall out of your boat. Cause you couldn't see anybody. Um, yeah, that was a rough one. 
It's like an old Napsy in the down in the yeah. hall of the boat. Nice. It's good. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Well, Andy, do you got anything left for, for Adam here? I, was, I guess the one question I'll have for you is if there's one thing that you can take away from the classic out of the entire experience, what would it be? Oh, man. Out of the whole thing? Yeah. The whole thing is so cool. I guess... Uh, when you pull into that arena and you look around at all the fans and then Dave Mercer calls your name out, like, there ain't nothing like it. Like, I'm already, like, I need to go back next year. Okay. I'm going to work my ass off to win another one so I can go back. I like it. Uh, it's not something you want to miss. Um but yeah, the whole thing, like all the fan, like day one, there's, it's raining, it's 50 degrees. Like I turn around and I look and they let all the fans out to come down by the boat ramp and they'd all stand there and watch takeoff. I don't know how many thousands of people were there, but I'm like, it's raining. Like, it's not nice out. Like people should be in bed <laughs> and they're all there to, to cheer us all on. Like it's. It's pretty damn cool. I can't, man. Well, I have no doubt that you will be back for damn sure. Um, I don't yeah. know how the heck you guys. I'm more impressed with all the anglers that can go through that boat drive through and not trip over, like being so nervous or just like <laughs> goosebumps getting on stage. So the impressive you can even get up there. I definitely would eat it and fall off the boat or something. Oh, I was worried about that the last day with the Super 6. Um my boat was about a foot and a half further away than it normally was. Like you had to jump. <laughs> I haven't watched any videos or anything, but like, I swear I stopped for a second, like just to, how am I going to do this? Like, a, I'm either going to completely miss it, land on the concrete. B I'm going to have one foot on the boat and I'm going to eat it on the concrete or C I'm going to get lucky and get in there. But it was a little bit of a stretch to get in. But it's like that's the one thing that's the one thing before all of it. Like you're just worried about doing something stupid like that, like tripping, getting out of your boat or something like that. Like you're more nervous about that than anything else. Uh, you know, you're in front of a lot of people. So you're like, please fast. don't be the next Pete Glusick and eat it <laughs> off a of bass boat. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, was it like I'm sure you've seen Zombie Land the movie, but it's like rule sixty seven or something. You have to limber up before doing anything. Like you think about like doing like a quick little squat there to like stretch the hammies out the right. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been hilarious, yeah. dude. If you just before you made the jump, you start stretching the little squat action and then you just get the jump over. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Muscles are already stiff because you've been fishing for three days, not drinking as much water as you probably should, dehydrated. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really awesome. Must limber up. Yeah. Yep. Well, dude, seriously, thank you so much for taking taking the time to come on here. I'm sure you're getting bombarded with phone calls, podcast requests, the whole nine, which you should be. Because, um, man, I seriously love the underdog story with you going into this event and uh, – Man, I'm just really looking forward to the future classic and a potential Sunday uh, after party burning it down with Adam Rasmussen. Heck yeah. Keep following. We'll do it. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for having me on. Thanks all the fans out there. Like, couldn't do it without everybody. So, heck yeah. Well, folks, uh, I have all the social for Adam down below. If you guys want to follow along, highly recommend that you do. Uh, we had a few people um actually mentioned about they in the comments here that they need to be booking guide trips with you if they need to do yeah. so what's the best way for them to do that uh just go to rasmussenoutdoors.com all the info's up there for salmon trout walleyes bass whatever you prefer and then uh shoot me an email or a text i usually if it's a number i don't know i don't always answer it right away if i'm on the water um either pre-fishing or guiding like I don't want to answer the phone when I have customers in my boat because they're paying to be with me. So shoot me a text or shoot me an email. We'll get you on the on the calendar and we'll go have some fun. Awesome. 
Heck yeah, man. Appreciate it once again. And uh, we'll be talking to you real soon, man. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care. Go catch him this week. All right. See ya. See you later. That is Adam Rasmussen, folks. Uh, Fulfilling the uh, the underdog story, and uh, I think there's a lot more of Adam Rasmussen left and future elite, but also classic uh, coming up here in the the, the coming years. So, um, dude, it's super cool. Like just having that background of you know being a walleye, salmon, multi species guide, uh, and coming down. Like we we were really teetering with the idea of like, man, I wonder if he if he can pull this off. How funny it would be <laughs> this first line? Is just like, yeah, this bass stuff, the best bass fishing stuff is easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. uh, it's super cool though. But uh, or if you pulled it off, how would Hamner be feeling today? Yeah, like, I, I mean, dude, I it's like it's in those those cases where you gotta just uh, you gotta just let whatever happen happen because it's yeah. like. This is where it's like such a struggle for me because I like Adam a lot. Would have loved to see him win because especially if he won, dude. Like, I didn't realize this at the time until uh, Ken Duke had told me on the last day, I believe it is. If Adam was to win, not only is he a classic winner, gets a berth next year, but he also gets a berth to the Elite Series. Yeah, because it's a legend exemption type deal, right? Something along the lines of that. I think if if a non elite person makes it, they qualify for the Elite the next year. Which I wonder actually how that factors in if they add one extra space elite series if that comes out of somewhere you know what i mean which that'd yeah, be it probably it probably comes out of the two-year average and somebody gets bumped that's already there yeah it'd be super interesting to uh sounds like a good this for the bass boat yeah. topic but um not, nonetheless adam is a, a stand-up dude and um was happy to see either him or hamner or you know any of the top 10 for that matter win one and um yeah i'm just so happy for for hamner man and uh absolutely we'll be getting him back on uh in the event that he won the classic he i don't know if people really understand the amount of calls interviews videos podcasts everything that they have to go through uh where i don't i would be very surprised if he's got much sleep at all uh since winning the classic from that point point on um so decided you know we're not going to get hammer on right away we're going to Try to be one of the guys that is, um, you know, giving him a few weeks, if not a month, and then we'll, we'll circle back here. Uh, but that being said, I'm fairly positive he was on Bass Talk Live and he'll be on Mercer, if not already, which looking really looking forward to those shows. Those guys really know how to bring in the the uh, a unique view to the champion's perspective. So super pumped for me. I couldn't be more happy for the guy. Uh, really, like we said it early on, one of the, the, the good guys won again. And we're, we're pumped for that, um, which is a weird thing to say because I feel like a lot of guys are the good guys, but there's, yeah. there's not many often classics where it's won by the bad guys, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. And speaking of good guys and speaking of champions, oh. uh, we got a quick commercial here from X2 Power, but uh, we got the kayak champ. I don't the know kayak. if there's a single thing. I, I don't know. I think he's running out of room on his wall in his room. He needs to expand. There is no room. There is. I think he's just creating storage space at this point. He's gonna add had a room off of the house. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the kayak fishing tournament realm that he hasn't won. Uh, either way, we will confirm that with him here after a quick message from our friends at X2 Power. In the world of battery power, a word to the wise: compromise elsewhere. All right, we're back, and we're back with the champion himself, Mr. Drew Gregory. What's going on, dude? What's, What's up, up boys? How's it going? How's it going? Congrats, champ. Yeah. Thanks, man. Pretty wild. Pretty wild for sure, man. But uh, I don't know what to say, man. Just kind of shrug the shoulder still, just in, in disbelief, <laughs> honestly. Just How like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bailey, you need to add the sound to the soundboard of the champ is here. Or whenever yeah. Gregory comes out, you know? <laughs> Mercer does a good job with that. Uh, 
<laughs> I think that's all he says after a guy wins the classic when you get back to the the bar or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. Champ, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> is it true now, Drew, that like have you won actually everything in kayak fishing there is to win? No, nah, man. I haven't won everything uh <laughs> for sure. Won some AOIs and won this, obviously, but this is the the first championship I've ever won. You know, like if you mm. you count the three big three, the Hobie TOC, uh, you know, Bassmaster, and oh, KBF you had a TOC championship. Win. I not I have an AOI with Hobie, but not a TOC win. Uh, so I'm just saying I uh, I don't have not ever won a championship. This is the big one, you know. So I was it's kind of like a weight lifted off my shoulders a little bit uh, because I've always wanted a championship to go along with the AOIs and of course the regular season, like national wins, you know, I, I don't know, eight of maybe eight of those or something. Hmm. And then one championship. So, but yeah, there's more to win. It's just, I don't know if I'll have a chance because, you know, kids, family running a new series myself, that, that kayak adventure series, I, I'm not going to be fishing as many events, you know, I'm going to focus more on Bassmaster than anything. So I'm not sure how many TOCs or, or KBF NCs I'll, I'll be fishing, but, I, you know, it's fine, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm blessed and enjoying what I'm doing. So can't complain. Heck yeah, dude. Well, I mean, getting on stage for, for somebody that in my mind has arguably done more for the sport than the vast majority uh, of kayak anglers. And dude, I, it was, it, I don't even think it was two years ago where you were really pushing for Bassmaster to, improve their ways when it came to kayak fishing because yeah. there was a time where let's just be blunt with it that it seemed like Bassmaster kayak series was doing it just to do it they weren't really doing it to do a good job uh yeah, and you yeah. were at the forefront of really helping change that and now look at it today where it's awesome man and steve owens was a big part of that i mean and i was definitely pushing and trying and, and one thing that's kind of cool is you know when you have done done it for as long as i have and you've kind of built a reputation you, there's definitely a little bit of a burden of responsibility. You know what I mean? To do what you can to not like irk the organizations and not try to push whatever or your agendas, whatever, but just try to push and grow it all for, for everyone. But it's kind of like the NFL draft, you know, when the first person, you know, everyone waits to kind of sign their deals with their agent until the first player signs. So they know like how much he's making. So what we're trying to do, I think Christine's a good example of that Russ, you know, Siddiqui won the championship, lots of other big names in the sport. You can, you know, I'm not and try to list them all. But whenever we have opportunities like this to push kayak fishing to the forefront and push it with some, you know, bigger non-endemic sponsors and use this, what it's really cool is we can kind of open up some avenues and some platforms for the future of the sport, if that makes sense. So we got it. You got to push it and do what you can, but, but at the same time, not pushing somebody away because you're being too pushy. So it's this little juggling act you got to do with some of these bigger companies and sponsors. So we're trying, we're trying. Well, I'd say you're doing a hell of a job, bro. Um, I'm obviously pumped for you. Uh, there's a lot of people in your corner that are pumped for you. Uh, and, dude, let's get into this freaking win, man. Yeah. The Lake yeah. 10 killer. It looked like uh, through keeping up with the standings, things like that, that it definitely wasn't easy for anybody. It definitely was tough. There's guys that had a great, like, one day, yeah. whether it was day one or day two, but it had a flop the, the other day. Mm -hmm. um, so it seemed like they were moving actively. Things were changing. So kind of kind of walk us through because I think your time that you shine, and I told you this in person that I think out of the entire scene of kayak fishing, I think you are the greatest kayak angler ever in regards to tournament strategy. And I th and I, I think that comes in practice, like yeah, in the, yeah, in driving strategy you do. So kind of walk us through that. Yeah, man, I'm gonna you make me spill the juice here, and that's all right because that's what we're here for. You guys are here to learn. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my strategy at this event. So first of all, the second they, I mean, had the word kill and the word 10 killer, I knew what I was doing when they said that. I mean, I knew exactly what I was doing. I, I I'm studied the entire United States. I know all the fisheries. I fished a lot of them, you know, back when I traveled with Jackson and hooked in wild waters and then now with Crescent and tournaments and then running my own series. You're constantly looking and scouring the, the, the map at where, where's some hidden gem fisheries and where's the place we can go that kayak can kind of excel and, and you know be a new kayak fishing destination that may not be so known by the bass boat world so i already knew about the illinois river and lake ten killer and what was unique about it in the sense that you know they put the tennessee river strain smallmouth in there back when there was like a fish kill they also i believe put uh florida strain largemouth so it's a total different animal than grand lake 
I mean, in a lot of ways, because Grand Lake has the Neosho smallmouth, which were native to 10 killer, but they don't get big, 16, 17 inches, right? So you got to understand like all about the, the, the world of bass fishing, where they live. And I, I just knew that it was where I was going to go because I've always wanted to fish it. It's been on a bucket list. I know there's giants that live there. Um, I definitely was surprised at how big the largemouth got in the river. That was what was surprising to me, but I knew some big smallmouth were there, but of course there's big smallmouth in the lake too and, and largemouth, but fitting my style, of course, you know, I was going to you know choose to go to the river because the lake was going to be more of a live scope. It was going to be a bigger player. It's not like there's grass or vegetation, something to punch some like cypress trees and swamps and backwaters to get away, you know, in a kayak, which is what I love to do. It was just the river. It was all I basically had. Uh, which was fine. But, but anyway, I, um, I realized that, you know, on first day of practice, kind of 20 and a half large mouth, like a five and a half pounder, maybe a little bit bigger. It was super fat and heavy and, um, caught a 19 and a half ish small mouth and small, like another 19, 17 inch large mouth. So I knew that's what I was doing. And I, uh, so speaking of strategy, so what I did is I went to the northernmost access, our, our launch, our designated launch on Saturday. And I went there first. Again, this is all like strategy talk, like you're saying, I did. I went there first because less people would be pre-fishing on Saturday than Sunday or Monday because some people aren't even getting there except for maybe two days before. They get only two days of pre-fishing or three. So four days before, I'm I'm hitting that spot. And there was actually a boat ramp. And then if you take a road to the left and, and kick your Tacoma and four-wheel drive, you can go down all the way to the end of that public access, another half mile up the river, and just launch right from the gravel bank right there. So I did that to stay kind of out of sight. Um you know, it's no different than any elite guy, man. They're out there. They don't want to be seen on their juice, on their stuff. They don't want to be visible at all. When they find it, they want to disappear, just vacate that area and hope that nobody else stumbles across it. So I went upstream, you know, a ways, saw kind of how far I could go, which was as far as I wanted to go, but also realized I needed to make some improvements on my Torquedo setup. So the next several days, I never was seen at that ramp again. I was out on the lake at one spot trimming the Torquedo properly uh actually making sure i could just it could chew the full amount of water as shallow as possible right and mm -hmm. um and once you get the suction going and it goes you can lean back and get it to go and then you can lean forward and you can go even faster and it'll stay chewing and it'll get shallower so i was able to draft and i'd say full speed maybe about six or seven inches of water with that thing so no different than a jack plate or something you know someone poche because what i'm doing is basically keep poche just the kayak world just my setup is totally you know defined uh, you know for those smaller backwaters and rivers and creeks you know it's just set up for that so i also i was able to hit i used to be able to hit 6.2 miles an hour in my sholey the crescent kayak sholey i'm using but now i'm going 6.7 i just kind of nascar engineered it the best i could wait forward and i'm going 6.7 now instead of 6.2 and so have you heard of anybody else doing this before maybe jeff little if any i've never heard of it jeff anymore. little is really good at it um and he's he's obviously a resource that has helped me out a lot and you guys can watch his videos on, on the little stuff on his youtube channel and he can he teaches i'm sure if you just consume it all he's probably taught a little bit about all, all the stuff on there but but you know he helped me out he's the torpedo um you know one of the, the managers over there for the pro staff before he left to go to boondocks but um yeah i just kind of got it rolling and trimmed perfectly and and then that helped me because I have to attain up some, some pretty steep inclines. You know what I mean? For the, the rivers, it's not like there's a big, like big rapids. It's more just like this steep gradient that gets real shallow and it gets, you know, six, seven inches, you know, and I can float in about four, three and a half, four, probably somewhere in there, but six, seven inches, I need that motor to go. And I need to, I had to paddle super hard with the motor on full speed and use my whitewater kayaking experience to understand how to read currents and where to like ferry across here to get up a little further and go back there and which angle to take while I'm paddling as hard as I can and going full speed with the torpedo just to get up some of the stuff. So I knew when I practiced, I actually didn't practice the first two miles ish two two and a half because I knew most people were going to hit that and beat it up and fish it. Even if you found there, you'd probably be competing with other people or, or fishing for a bunch of fish that have already been caught in, pr in practice, you know? So right. I focused all my efforts about two and a half miles up and beyond a long way. I mean, really far, probably like eight or nine miles up. And so every day since then I put in at different access points further up because I wanted to 
learn how to catch them in the river, even if it was further up. I mean, I fished as far as 13 to 14 miles up one, one day, not, not to like think I was ever going to get that far with battery power and everything, just to learn how to catch them in the river. If that makes sense. I don't yeah. want to beat up my fish. I just want to go catch and learn how to catch them and then apply that into the, into the section that I know I've already found good ones. Cause I had like 90, 91 and a half inches in four hours on the first day pre-fishing. So anyway, I ended up um, just, you know, launching at it. Like I said, a couple of different public access points that were further up. And then basically what I did is I floated down one day all the way to the point that I'd gotten all the way up from that first day of practice. You know what I'm saying? That when I went up about three and a half miles. So then mm -hmm. when I stopped there, I was kind of keeping an eye on making sure I didn't see anybody else. When I stopped at that point, I went back upstream just to make sure I could complete it all. Went all the way up. Like I said, I went as far as 13 or 14 miles up, not to like do it actually thinking I was going to need to go that far in the tournament, but just, just in case, you know what I mean? Like if I managed the battery power properly, like I wanted to find everything I could that was, I thought would be to myself. So that's what I did yeah. and uh, caught some big ones way upstream too. Nice 19 and a half inch smaller way up there. And uh, a couple key fish came from, from way up, but yeah, that was the strategy that, that I employed. And to your, to your point, it was just, uh, just worked out, man. <laughs> that's awesome. And yeah. to that extent, like, I think that's next level, like unbelievable, but, Insane. um, Anthony guys here, any specific methods of setting up the kayak for weight distribution? I know you mentioned yeah. motor angle, but also you leaning like back to get it some grip on the prop yep. and then leaning back forward. Is there anything yep. though that you put to any more additional weight in the back or in the front on purpose? So what I did is I, Anthony, I put my uh, two bad, two extra batteries were in the front hatch to get more weight there. And then one sometimes would be even in the little cubby that the Sholi has. It's like a fish finder cubby. That's three up there. And I also got our high seat from Crescent. Now the Sholi's not made for the high seat. You can certainly use it in the high position, but in the low position, the bar is actually hit. So it doesn't work. So what I did is actually moved it forward because I wanted my body weight to be further forward too than the actual seat position. It, it sits in naturally in the Sholey. So I moved it a little bit further forward and used those three quarter inch cam straps that come with the Sholey to crank it down. And it kind of made little nice impressions on the pad kit and just kind of held right there tight. So I'm actually probably like six, six or eight inches further forward than you would normally be seated. So between those three batteries and my personal weight being that much further forward, it, it really made the difference. And I mean, it is, it was cruising, man. It was, it was pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Jeez. <laughs> but has this given you new ideas for Crescent now for, for maybe a, a new model in the future? Yeah. I mean, I've always known like about, you know, again, talking with Jeff a little, I kind of know, you know, where if you're designing a boat, that's just for power, you know what I mean? For motors, we kind of know some of the things we should do, what we could do. So there's no doubt about it. What, whenever we design one that's like that, you know, we'll technology will keep changing. And I, I got some tips and tricks and things we could do. But right now we got a cool CK2 boat that's kind of filling that that gap for us for a power boat. I mean, the Sholey's obviously great too, but if you want a little bit bigger boat, you know, and it's even a little bit faster, that's a good one to, to, to go for. But I mean, uh, dude, getting that Sholey up to 6.7, it's it's – it's pretty darn good. You can't beat it. Cause now you can take the Torquedo off or Newport or whatever you use. You can take it off and then it's your awesome, just floating, you know, float down a river and Creek boat, very maneuverable, good paddling boat. But, um, and I do have videos. I'll pull up some videos never before seen. Um, I've got them edited. If you guys want to see some of the fish catches and talk over the, uh, the day, I know I'm going to go on kayak fishing weekly too. So Justin mm -hmm. and I are going to hammer this thing out in, in even more detail than, than, you yep. know, today. So I'm excited about that, but I definitely have some videos. I want to share with you guys. You can talk over some baits, whatever, whatever you guys want to yeah. hit. Yeah. So on a chatterbait. Yeah. one fish on a chatterbait, Andy, one surprise. It was probably a big smallie too, wasn't it? No, no. It was the biggest fish of the tournament, bro. It was a 22 inch. It's right there in the queue. 22 right. inch large mouth. It was like six and a half pounds. Um, and I'll, it, it's, man, it's real interesting what the strategy was and how it worked. I mean, and, and Bailey, you can pull that in whenever you want out, but I'll talk about, mm -hmm. so day one. So here's what's Here's the funniest part of the story. Yeah. You guys can um, see the funniest part of the story is on day you one. It? Uh, it didn't yeah, come it, up. I heard it, it for a second. There. Let's see. I'm trying to add it to the stage here. Oh, here. Can you see yeah, it now? The stage. There we go. Yeah. It's just full screen. It's in that little foam pit right behind it. And the eight inches of water, oh, 10 inches of water. Oh, this is the first fish of day two when I was in fourth place after day one. So it's the very first fish. It's just 
Bonds. That's dangerous oh, throwing a chatterbait in all that wood, too. Yeah, you gotta be very accurate with your casting. <laughs> yes! Is that a lamprey on it, too? Wow. Oh, the lamprey, yeah, I don't know. Project Z chatterbait. If, uh, oh, I'll back up and see that again, the lamprey on it. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll pull it up in a, in a yeah, second again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the dang ski goggles is what I was laughing at when you first yeah. showed me this clip. <laughs> oh, those are yeah. good. And you put yeah. like foam inserts on the back to cut out light penetration too, didn't you? Or no, something. no, that was actually Did the. Yeah, look at it here. Watch. Oh, my old faithful. Back it up. Oh, sorry, I was messing with it too at the same time. But yeah, you can see. Um, those are just Smith Optics Pursuit glasses. Oh, they're actually. They're not. I don't know if they originally made for fishing, oh, my or what they're actually Stay for. That fish got some hair, dude. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Fish did get some air for a six pounder, six and a half yeah. pounder. Yeah, it did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that, my old dude. faithful project. Z ready to go snowboarding after this. Size yeah, this thing, yeah. <laughs> me too. I'm ready to go. Let's go. That was a cha project Z chatterbait with a chatter spike on it. If you keep uh, playing it, you'll see the uh, the next angle shows just kind of how big you can tell, like how fat. Inches. Oh, yeah, yeah. solid six and a half ish. Oh, that's a great way to start the tournament. Morning on final day, fast yep. pack series championship. That's awesome, dude. But yeah, that was so a cool, ready to spawn. cool catch. So what you were well, looking, guys? Real fast, Drew. I got to give yep. you a shout out here. So right. this is what you see. People just saw like seven, seven different camera angles, and you walking through this. That is professional. That is next level. <laughs> going out of your way it's one for content sake sponsors and also just for people to see the full realm of everything that's going on that was yeah yeah awesome. i mean i did it too just guys with just two gopros i mean you know i cut in on one that made it look different and then and then i changed the angle when i'm releasing it like you're saying bailey just so that mm -hmm. you can get the water and you guys see the water so it looks like I'm using all these cameras but really it's just two and i just run the one behind me full time you know and then the uh the one in front i only hit you know, just for the kind of hero shot to hold it up, you know, or sometimes I'll hit it in the middle of a fight of a fish. Once they're on, I'll just hit, just tap it just to, so you don't have to like burn a bunch of data. It's not like you're scrubbing through tons of footage at the end of the day. It's just that one behind you is all you got to worry about really. So anyway, but um, it was cool to see them put that on the Bassmaster classic screen when I'm on the stage, you know, behind me. Um, and that was, that's kind of the premise of that kayak adventure series where we have the results in those theaters and we're going to be able to put people's footage on that big screen. That's the idea. So I know yeah. it's a little bit more entertaining when we get to see those fish catches fresh, but, um, but yeah, that slew behind me when you guys saw that. So basically what I did is I would start at that spot. The large mouth bite was a little bit more consistent. You know what I mean? It's a little safer because the small mouth are in the main river. It's crystal clear and falling and dropping and getting clear by the day. And they are hard to catch when it's that clear, but the slew that you saw all behind me in that clip, when you, when I'm, when you go back and watch that clip, just, you can, people will see it. I'll post it uh, on my, page i think z-man already posted it that's all all back there's a slew and there's beavers back there and a lot of wood and the beavers stir it up it's it's murky because beavers it's not murky because of the it, of the last rain you know last, last flood and it just stays muddy now it's just kind of muddy from the beavers and so where i caught that fish was right on the edge of that clear water meeting the, the murky water so it was kind of like you know it goes from 10 foot visibility to like two or three kind of where that that fish was a nice two you know two foot Perfect of visibility spot yeah, so I threw the chatterbait because it was easy on the backside of that log. I knew I could kind of hit that spot, hit the log, bounce it off in that little foam pit. And the chatterbait to me, I just know a big bass loves a bluegill. They just love it. It's like they want a big brim. They do. And so I've caught so many fish on that breaking brim pattern, uh, Project Z chatterbait. Uh, and now with the chatter spike, it's, it just looks just like one. So I threw it in there because it looks realistic like what they want. And then, then as I went back in that slough, I would, it got murkier. I would go back to your typical like Oklahoma style spinnerbait, just spinnerbaiting on the wood. And I would even have like a, a painted chartreuse blade, a wide willow leaf blade. I didn't really want quite like a Colorado. I didn't really want a willow, but kind of in between, you know, where I can kind of slow it down. The water's in the mid fifties. So I didn't want it to be, you know, maybe upper fifties later in the day, but I didn't want it to go too fast. I wanted to go real slow as I could around that wood. So it was a chartreuse blade i had two skirts on i wanted to bulk it up so it displaces more water around it so double skirt uh, z-man minnows a pearl with chartreuse tail just this bright gaudy thing for the muddy muddy stuff the chatterbait and the jig were kind of more in when it was like two foot of vis visibility and then when i leave that slew after i get a limit which i got on a limit on day one I had everything over 16 inches day one i had like a 19 and three quarters i had a 17 and three quarters i had 16 and a half, you know all 16s when i left though that's a smallmouth game 
once I leave, it's all like, okay, let's see if we can fool one, at least one or two good smallmouth in that clear water. And then I went all the way upstream to uh, this next, I'll, I'll show you another one. If you want to see the smallie. Sure. And uh, yeah, why not? Right. We're, Coming we're here for. Clips. While you're looking for that, Drew, it's right what, uh, River Smalley on is asking what action and power is that rod? So with my style, when I say my style, I think a lot of people know I've talked about this a lot. I just power fish. I try to prefer to find fish I can power fish with like a medium heavy action. Typically, I use different length rods depending on the size of the river or where I'm fishing. Could be as long as seven foot six on the Susquehanna or somewhere with real crystal clear water. I can just launch it. And have tons of leverage you know i need long long casts or if i'm in a small creek it could be six foot sevens but i try to keep all my rods and i'm throwing the spinner baits chatter baits buzz baits swim baits on the same length and same power just so i can have the same feel when i pick up the other one and make the cast right it's just it's like you know it is the first cast so if you go from a seven six to a six foot seven it's way off the mark well that could cost you. you could get hung up you could miss the fish you could spook it it could definitely cost you so i keep them all the same as sort of a Bryson DeChambeau in golf setup, right? Where they're all, all the clubs are the same length. So the, his backswing, everything feels the exact same. So in this particular tournament, I was using seven foot three. Um, pretty much every rod I think was seven foot three, medium heavy and 30 pound sunline SX one braid. Um, I had, I had a couple with, uh, with fluorocarbon on for that clear water. Never really ended up using them, um, or needing them. But, um, but yeah, this next clip, so I go way upstream after day one. I had a good limit on my way upstream. Just so you know, my, my, uh, Torquedo did give me a problem and I didn't have it for like 30 minutes and it was freaking me out. Cause I didn't, it was giving me an error code and I thought I'd ruined it, you know? I, so this is the Z-Man Gobia. So the spinning rod, so you can see, trust me, I've caught plenty of fish on a spinning rod, but I will look like, I mean, I'm freaking out here. I'm just, she's in a lot of open water. I'm just letting her do her thing, just like you'd be out there, Andy, on the Great Lakes, basically, just letting her do her thing. And the reason I, I hold my reel a lot, I mean, not like holding it, but I'm right there ready to like put pressure on it is because I'm throwing eight pounds straight braid. And there's a log, there's a few logs that are over there, and I'm ready for her to make a run towards one. And I can, I can scoot, let me zip it forward a little bit. This takes a while. So I'm going to tell you guys right now, just to show you that. Every pro elite angler, uh, you know, I know has seen themselves do dumb things and they have regretted like, or they look back and they cringe. I'm going to look back and cringe because I have a net right behind me and I just hardly catch fish on spinning rods and I just don't really like using nets. I'm not a fan. I love, I'm just old school. I like the, the challenge of getting them with your hands and it's stupid. makes no sense because it's legal and I should do it. But I know it looks cool just to grab them with your hand, but I should have grabbed the net because this is, this fish is running towards an underwater log right now. And I want to hold that reel and put pressure on it to be able to, you know, force it out from that log if I need to. But what happens here is I freak out and I panic. And I just start grabbing the line. It's a big no-no. No, 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 no. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do so. Do as I say, not as I do right here. No, 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 no. And I'm going to show you the front clip in a minute. But that as soon as I belly this, see that log under the water? As soon as I belly this fish in, guys, the gobius falls out of her mouth. You'll hear me say it. I'm like, oh, shoot. What am I doing? What am I doing grabbing the line? Oh my god, the gobius just fell out. Oh my god. <laughs> so, you got lucky on that one, dude. I got lucky. I got very lucky. That's why I say do as I, I say, not as I did there. That was really, really bad. Um Hey, when it's your time, it's your time, man. That's right. When it's your time, it's your time. Um <laughs> play that next one to hear uh if you want Bailey. You got it. Just... these things loaded in here. Oh yeah, I got yeah. I'm loaded. This well, is your but, show, Jerry. I'm gonna go upstairs. You take you just take, I'll take, I'll take yeah. yeah, Texas when you're you ready. Can get rid of the other ones, but this is yeah, this is the front, this is the front camera. You can probably notice I hit the GoPro in the middle of that fight. I'm just taking my time. It's 2 30. There's only 30 minutes left in the tournament on day one when this happened. So I am freaking out because I know this might be my only big bite. No, 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 and I went no, no, way no, no, upstream no, no. to get this fish. No, 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 no. I was running a lot of times, so I wasn't even making a lot of casts. I was just trying because I saw no, 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 no. ones of this on this bend um in pre-fishing i saw some real big ones so i knew they were there i just had to go small and subtle okay. that line again it, <laughs> this is this is the same fish the same fish oh, got it watch the gobies fall out oh my just, God, the gobies just well fell out. i guess you didn't see oh it my God. but you can see it hanging there so that's the same fish from the front angle but um that's awesome if you go back to the other one you can zip and you can see the fish and watch the, the release or whatever if you want while we talk but 
that was a, a huge fish, man. And it took me a long time to get up there to it. And uh, then I just had to execute. And like you said, when it's your time, you're, it's your time. And kind of got, kind of got lucky on that one there. Shouldn't have done that. But, and then uh, the bit, the one that I think Tom Hanks cringe. <laughs> That's funny. The one that you on, uh, on day two, I'll recap day two. And then you can pull up the next video. It's the big 21 and, a quarter inch small. He's the last one. Oh, I got to get rid of some of these videos. It's saying <laughs> yeah, from this video. You, you got rid. You got all it's my. Telling me to remove them. Through. Yeah. <laughs> yell that. Well, you can remove them too. <laughs> all right, but anyway, I'll add it right now. So this is so just this is what happened. So on day so that got me to ninety inches, right? So on day one, yep. I had ninety inches, and then um, day two, I start in that slough again, right? I go up, start in the slough, and then. I had uh, that big one that we just saw, the 22. That was actually on day two. And then I had um, a 16 in that slew, and I missed. I missed three others. I'll pause it and set up the scene here. I missed three others um, in that slew. So I'm very nervous because now I went around the slew a second time hoping to get bit again. So I could. I wanted to leave with a limit like I did on day one because that makes you feel comfortable, especially going out in that clear water. Well, the night before – even though it's a little bit of blue sky there, it was mostly cloudy that this day and a little bit drizzly and cloudy. And that's what they were predicting. So I knew to catch those fish, I either had to go finesse, finesse, or like I did on day one in the bluebird skies or really big. And so, cause it was going to be cloudy and windy, you know, and possibly drizzly. I knew there was some pools with some giant smallmouth way up there that I had seen. And I was like, I went over to Jimmy Houston's outdoors. I grabbed a Zal dangerous fully loaded swim bait. And cause we watched Tyler Berger's video at the house with the guys at the Airbnb. And he was, he did the report on all the swim baits and that one actually tested really good because it started working at like one mile an hour and it, and it blew out at three point something. So Tyler, thank you. Bass fishing HQ. And uh, so I went up there, I got that, but they only had, I wanted a fast sinking cause I wanted to get down deep and they didn't, the only fast sinking they had was a trout, a trout pattern. I, I don't care. I'm like, whatever. Yeah, we all know what's going to happen if you throw a goldfish into a lake. We, you know what I'm saying? Like, who cares if it's a trout and there's no trout here? I'm throwing this sucker because it's going to get down to where I need it to get in the current. So uh, I, I leave the slew with those two fish, that 22 and the 16. I go upstream, and I was just making some casts with a spinnerbait as I'm working my way up, and I catch a, catch a couple small spotted bass, 14 and a half inches. And then I hook a, on the Z-Man sling blade spinnerbait, hook a 19 and a half smallie. Fight it for like 30 seconds. It jumps. This would have been five and, sp and throws the, the, the spinnerbait. And I'm like heartbroken because I know that's Bassmaster Classic stage. If that fish gets in the boat, I don't think I win with that one. I don't know if I'm going to win, but I know for sure that puts me on the stage, right? And gets me in the top 10. So I'm sick to my stomach because in this clear water, I'm just not sure how many more fish I'm going to catch. I didn't catch a lot of fish outside of that slew on day one because, first of all, you're running half the, you know, more than half the time just to get to the places you're trying to fish. And it's not easy. Right. So second, you just don't have that many casts, but I knew the cloudy skies would work to my advantage. But when I hooked that fish, I was frustrated, but I was going to take something positive for, from it. And I was like, you know what? God showed me that they are on, even the big smallies will be on the wood, which they weren't on in all of practice. They weren't, they just weren't on the stuff that you'll see in that video right there on the right. You see that, that log, that's where I caught this fish. I turned my camera on right after I hooked it. And that's why we don't have it from cast to catch exactly. But you can play this now. This is that Zal Dangerous swim bait, and this is the 21 and a quarter, nearly six pound, I would say, small mouth that, you know, to go along with that 22 inch large mouth that really helped me, you know, win this thing. And watch how big this jump is right here. When you see this jump to the right, you're like, oh my lord. When it breaches, it looks like a day. Now watch my paddle go away too, floating down the river. <laughs> You're a hot yeah. mess. It, it was a it was a mess. Trust me. Watch this. Watch you this thing right here. Leash. Watch this right here. This jump. So freaking oh, wow. giant, dude. I was like, good trees, smallies is, and trees, no good. <laughs> no, no good. But at least I got thirty pound braid and a giant hook in her. You know what I mean? So again, just kind of. That's awesome. Your paddle is gone. Yeah. How did you, speaking of that, how did you get your paddle back? Yeah, that's a story. Uh, that's a story <laughs> in itself. But uh, pl play that next that front angle video while we I tell you that story. Because okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I, I'm gonna just gonna exit. I'm gonna produce from back in. This is your. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what happened is I went to the bank to go. Wait, I want you guys to see the front angle because the audio is a little bit clearer. And it. Uh... Come on, girl. Come on, girl. 
don't jump, just don't jump. I sound, I kind of sound like Zaldane. Dude, how he's always like, no, 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 But you can just see the panic in my breath and everything. Knowing what this could mean. Look at that trout. There we go. Oh, God. Get in the boat. Yeah. Oh, my God. What just happened? Anthony, he's right about that. <laughs> it reminds me of my toddler too or my kid you know both my kids yep. just make a tornado but uh anyway the uh so the paddle goes downstream i didn't realize it until after i'd already scored the fish and everything and i'm like where's my paddle where's my paddle i need that paddle to keep going upstream to catch more fish to get to some of those bigger pools where where they were and i i had ended up like motoring downstream looking for it and at one point i was like oh, i don't want to motor down this really bad like you know, section of shallow water I had to go. And so I just, I beached it, you know, ran right down there along the, along the bank and, uh, saw it floating and, and I had to swim in 55, 58, whatever it was, 57 degree water across the river to get it. And, uh, it was miserable. I'd like take everything out of my life jacket, my phone, my keys, and it, cause it wasn't going to come back around to me for a while. And it kind of stopped on the other side to swim over there. I mean, it cost me like half an hour, you know what I mean? To, oh to do gosh. that. It was, it was frustrating, but Anyway, it was uh, it was it's pretty wild, but I got it back. Ended up getting further upstream and caught one other little, you know, sixteen and three quarter inch largemouth that uh, ended up calling up uh, a fourteen and a half inch or one of the fourteen and a half inches. So ended up with that uh, lone fourteen and a half inch uh, on the the string. I actually got hit by the way on that uh, Zal Dangerous another time in a big pool, but it didn't hook up. But I felt the weight; it was heavy, so I felt like I could have had a lot bigger day if I'd caught that nineteen and a half that that threw off and then caught whatever bit that swim bait. And then any of the three fish in the slough that I missed on the spinner bait, um, could have been a lot, a lot bigger, could add nearly a hundred, but, but you know, that's a winning spot when you can lose that fish. I mean, that's a true winning spot when you can, you know, survive a, several blows like that of lost fish. That's, that's how you win tournaments. Cause I mean, it's hard to fish perfectly clean, you know, it just is. So, but what a, what a crazy event. And the scariest part was, uh, honestly, after that first day of practice, our Airbnb was right on the road that everybody had to drive down to. It was five minutes from the, the northernmost launch, you know, on the river there. And it was crazy seeing people go by every day trying to fish the river, fish the river, pre-fishing. It, it was so nervous. Steve Owens at, at check-in even said, man, you don't look like yourself. What's going on? You okay? And I didn't really know. And, and somebody at my house, I think Jake uh, Hepner. He asked me the same thing. He's like, you don't seem like yourself. That's just because I was nervous from day from the first day all the time. And it, it's tough. You want to help you know, friends out at the house, but they're also your competitors. You can't really tell what you were doing, where you were at. You know, I caught them and I caught them pretty good today, pre-fishing in pocket X or whatever. Um, and, and it puts people in an awkward position anyway. If you tell them, oh, I was up the river and smashed them. Well, now it puts them in a weird spot, like, because, well, Drew's my friend and he just told me where he's at and I don't want to go step on his toes. I'd, they just need to go find it and figure it out for themselves. And if they find it good for them and John Dalton, um, Creek fishing adventures, he actually slept in on day two. He's on the couch snoring when I left. And the day before I woke him up and he said, you know, Hey, I got my alarm set for six and it's five 58. I was like, Oh my bad dude. And, um, and so the next day I didn't wake him up and he slept into like seven 30 and he drove five minutes down to that ramp and uh caught 93 and three quarter inches the second biggest limit of the entire tournament uh, pretty much within sight of that horseshoe bin public access area so there were fish there and people practiced it and fished it all uh pre-fishing but the weather conditions when they went there on sunday and monday were tough so they struggled and that's why it was just myself and steve baker who's the only other angler who had a setup like mine that was and he actually got up with me like probably five or six miles upstream good good friend of mine good guy from ohio here northeast ohio and I know he, he appreciates and loves the, the kind of style of fishing that I do. And, and uh, Jeff little preaches and he's got his set up really nicely. And he was able to get up all that stuff too. And, um, but you know, he didn't have the greatest day um, on day one, but uh, he was definitely was on the right. He had the right idea, the right you know concept, but yeah, that was it. I'm surprised nobody else showed up and I was nervous about that all practice. But um, in day two, I kind of had it all to myself and, and knew I just needed to execute at that point. Barely That's did awesome. those, those belly flops, belly flips him in the boat, and Gobius is falling yeah, out. Man. Pan it was it was just true Drew chaos, man. It really was. So <laughs> it's not true chaos; it's Drew chaos. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> yeah, true chaos it. for sure, for sure. But <laughs> Put it was on fun. T-shirt. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Dude. What was like the one moment throughout each day where 
I mean, I know you fish with, with full confidence in every event that you're in. So I'm not going to ask of like, what's the moment you think that you thought you won it? Because knowing you, you're like, yeah, I could win here before you even event starts. But like, well, what was, <laughs> yeah. What, what's one moment though, where you kind of just like, man, I think I got this thing. Uh, well, I, I, I told my roommate, um, good friend of mine, Ryan Reed, the, the real yak dragger, you know, you know, guys know him probably. He, uh, he was asking us in the house. We were talking about, he said, what do you think it's going to take to win? I said, 180 inches, 180. And I had 90 on the first day. And the second day I had 90 and a half after I caught, I was pretty close to that after I caught that big one. But when I caught that small 1675 to get rid of that one 14 half inch spot, I knew I was at 90 at 90 and a half. And I, I did, that put me at 180 because I had 90 the day before I was like, it's, it's going to be tough to, for that to get beat. You know, but get, three people got more than that, you know, on day one. And if those three obviously did that again, then I would have lost. But I know it's difficult because the lake gets, you know, there's a lot of pressure out there on those spots. Uh, day after day, all the pre-fishing, all the anglers, it's it's a if fish is small, that lake does, you know, it's, what is it, 12, 13,000 acres? It's not, it's not real big. Yeah, not really there's big. only so many designated launches. There's only, you know, 164 anglers. That's a lot of, a lot of people. And uh, only two of us were on that far northernmost launch. So everyone else is down. So I knew they were going to have a hard time um, for sure. And uh, I think that big, when I caught that big one, I thought I really had a chance, especially because I thought, well, I can easily get rid of two 14 and a half. Surely I had like another two hours of fish plus getting up to the spot where I caught that 19 and a half on that Gobius that popped out. I knew I had all that good stuff up ahead, but here's what's crazy about fishing. You really have to fish the moment every day. They change. They were not on the wood like that. If I don't lose that 19 and a half on the, on the wood, on the spinner bait, I never even throw at this log that you saw me catch that fish on because I practiced that stuff. And in, pra in practice, they weren't on it. They just were not on that because the water temperature when I was in those days was the days that fishing was very tough for everybody. It was Sunday, Monday, up further in that section of the river, A, and B, the river was higher, so it was it was more current on that wood than there was on, by the time day two rolled around, and it got slower and slower, and they sort of meandered back to that stuff because they want to be there. They want to go to the slower, deeper pools when the river is a little higher and, the, and not to exert a lot of energy. And once the water temperature warmed plus fell and it allowed, the, allowed it to be moderate current right there, they moved back on it. And if I don't find it – so. But I think definitely that that big one was where I think I got a chance for sure. But the funniest part of this whole thing is, um, like I said, that's been my plan. I know that river. I'm I'm excited about it. It's been my plan since day one. But when Josh Shrinko won on the Susquehanna River, Smalley Talk podcast, you know, Josh, a Sheegan brand, when he won, he's a good friend of mine. We were staying at the same Airbnb. and b I was so happy for him because he's a good guy, a good friend. But you know what the other thought in my mind was? that's one darn good smallmouth angler. And he knows he's going, cause he qualified for this championship at that event. It's the only bass yeah. mastery fish he qualified. I knew it qualified him for this event. And I thought that's one more good river angler. That's going to find these fish. And that, and I was not really, I was like, dang, but Josh decided, you know, not to fish the event. Um, you know, it's wow. you know, obviously it's a big expense to go all the way out there. He didn't have the, the motor. He fished the Susquehanna. He just has a, I think a Hobie. Um, what's the one, the inflatable I 11. I track. I track, I track, he has that with no motor. So he, it would have been very hard for him to obviously get yeah. where I did, but given how much time he had from late summer, you know, on the Susquehanna to this event, he could have built and developed a whole setup and, and done that. But, um, but that's how much my mind was like, so dialed in from the very moment they announced this. Plus it's my first event I fished all year. I mean, all I've been thinking about is this event and working on it and scouting and strategizing. And I got to give a huge shout out to innovative sportsmen because without their rock guard and their steering triangle and their grass cutting blade, all of the accessories that they provide for the Torquedo, this doesn't happen. I mean, I had to get out and still tighten that rock guard many times because you're banging a lot. And that Torquedo is just such a solid motor. It's unbelievable what you can do with that thing and beat it up. And, and if it's, if that doesn't work, it's, you know, it's like the bass boat guys always, you know, complimenting their Mercury or, or Yamaha or Skeeter or whatever. I mean, uh, Suzuki, whatever motor they're running. It's true. If you don't get to the fish, you know where they are. You can't get to them. You don't win. So definitely had to give a big shout out to those companies for sure. Yamaha Torquedo for, for making a great solid motor and innovative sportsman for those accessories that you absolutely have to have. And thanks Trey for sending me an extra rock guard. I actually had it mailed. Two, he, he was on Logan Martin crushing it on the 
Hobie Bass Open Series. And he said, as soon as I get back on the mail, you know, the rock guard, because my rock guard had broken. And I went to my local welder here in Ohio and he, he fixed it, but I was still not trusting it. And it actually cracked. The one that they welded cracked in pre-fishing. And if Trey doesn't send me that rock guard, if he doesn't, you know, ship it to the Airbnb there, I don't, I don't win this thing. You know what I mean? I don't get to those fish because you had to have the exact setup I had. You had to have it. You couldn't get to them. So big thanks to those guys. You're on another level of strategy, dude. <laughs> said it earlier i'll say it again there's no one that touches you when it comes to strategy impressive well man that's a good segue thank you bailey for saying that and, and uh it's a good segue to probably say i'm gonna be offering some more virtual classes to helping people consulting for strategy on tournaments and probably even finally gonna break down and get on the uh, fish tips we'll see i know uh, uh -oh. austin's been you know on me about it and like dude you need to get on this and and he makes a lot of good points um and your guides you get this i mean there's nothing wrong. There's nothing illegal about any tournament angler hiring a guide and people do it all the time before the cutoff happens. That guy is going to share you tips, waypoints, how to catch them, all the information. You're going to pay the guide. Cool. That's totally legal in our sport. Nothing wrong with that, but why not? Why shouldn't the anglers be able to virtually give whatever tips they want and, and make that extra income? Cause as you guys know, you do not get rich in this sport at all. You don't do this to get rich. So I'm going to probably get on there, probably offer a fish tip where if you have a tournament coming up, I will be your loan. I will never let more than one person. Cause you, what's cool about fish tips is you can limit it to how many people you want to buy, buy the tip. You can limit it to what the tip is. It could be consulting. Could be, I think Ish Monroe has a phone call for 30 minutes with him for a thousand bucks. I mean, you said everything, the price, whatever you want to do. I'll consult people on their tournaments and it doesn't mean you're going to obviously catch them and win, but my my strategy what i do and kind of like taking everything that i've kind of like that that i've wrapped in this head over the years of experience you know with fishing my style uh and, and i just want to put myself always in the best odds to be successful and keep a high floor because that's what tournaments are about you can't win them all this is an individual sport that's like impossible but you what you want to do is raise your floor because winning and fishing is basically being in that top 25 percent or just cashing a check that's kind of like considered a win so i want to help people like at least learn why I would narrow it down to this extra area here, this section. And I can't promise they're going to be there, but, but I can tell you, that's what I would do. And generally the first place I find on them at my a spot where I think it's going to be one or, or do well, usually is the place that it ends up being the best just because I've done it so many times. I've looked on the map, I've scouted it and then I've gone there and then I've fished it. So I kind of like, then you take that information back and you're like, okay, you keep learning and keep putting it into, it's like AI, right? This database in your head, AI scours the whole internet for all the information about whatever topic. And then it spits out, spits it out to you. That's kind of what, when you, you know, study satellite and, and Navionics or whatever you do, and then you go fish it, You've learned now what that looks like on the map and now what it also fishes like. And you just start to piece it all together. So I'll probably consult with like one person on a tournament and that's it. Cause I don't want to give like 10 people the same information. I'll, I'll consult with one person and uh, you know, try to hopefully help them learn something that certainly may not win and can't guarantee any of that. You got to go and execute and, and figure it out. But anyway, Good segue to that. So I appreciate the the compliments on the strategy, and I just love it, man. I love that part of it. It's probably one of my favorite parts, the pre pre planning and all that stuff, and the strategizing. And the other thing I do on a strategy level, Bailey, that I'm um, really big on is I look and see, figure out what spot is the spot that is the winning spot, and everyone else is going to find it, and I get rid of that spot because if everyone's finding it, it's obvious, and they they cannibalize it, it's not no longer a winning spot. Like there's a spot that's probably the best spot in all these lakes but it's not the best winning spot. You know what I mean? If like a lot of mm -hmm. people are all over it. So you've got to find the spots that are a little bit like B, B range spots, B level. They're not, but you might have that B spot to yourself potentially because it's a little Especially, bit. Especially I feel like that comes into play bigger when uh, more big, I, I don't even know my vocabulary that I'm using at the moment. That that's more prominent in multi-day tournaments is having those B and C spots. Absolutely. That give you, better than average quality or really good right. quality fish, but you're not catching as many. Yeah. If you find a megawatt somewhere on the A prime spot, there's going to be probably 30 kayaks in that area. Right? Other people probably have found it. Yeah, exactly. More and more, more these days with technology and with the information on YouTube that helps us just find, and we know where they're going to be 
on these lakes, it's, it's, it's tough, man. I mean, I, you guys can, we can probably think of like, like, look at the latest. Uh, did you guys watch that? Uh, red crest was they, uh, where Michael Neal was and he was leading, he was crushing it and all those opening days I and mean, just, just killing it. And we thought, well, this is it, but it wears out. Like you said, multi-day tournaments. That's what it is, Andy. Yeah. It'll wear out and you got to have those, those B spots that aren't really quite as obvious to go along with it. Of course, milk that hit the A spot first on multi-day tournaments, get what you can out of it then bounce to the spot that you feel like is going to not going to be found by the other anglers quite as much. So definitely strategy to all of this stuff um, for sure. So, yeah. And I, I do want to say shout out to Steve Owens and Bassmaster. They put on an incredible show. They really are doing a great job. Um, and also uh, Dwayne at Tourney X, that's a great platform. One, you know, to, it just makes our sport so much fun to, to have that app so easy to use and just right there, seeing everything live. So Big shout out to those guys. Um, I'm trying there's anyone else that really, uh, all the guys at the Airbnb, all the people who I actually borrowed a lot of batteries from so many people. <laughs> I mean, I actually had to uh, put my second Torquedo together after it was giving me the error code on day one. I didn't want to risk it. I had a backup Torquedo that I just sold my buddy Zach here in Northeast Ohio. And I said, dude, do you mind if I borrow this thing back to have an extra Torquedo just in case this other one? for some reason fails because the new torpedoes, we don't get them on team torpedo. We don't get them until may like probably may mm -hmm. this year. So I thought we were getting them earlier. That's why I went ahead and sold it to him. So big shout out to Zach for letting me take his torpedo up there. And, uh, and I had to re-rig that whole thing on day. I had to, you know, set it all up the rock guard, do it all up and just strip the other one down and reset it up. I did not want to risk the error code happening again. So there are so many things, uh, but yeah, thanks to everyone. I think was it, Parker, uh, I mean, Ryan Parker, Billy Chambers, they let me borrow batteries, Dustin Hoy, um, Jonathan over there at Eco Fishing Shop. I just wanted to have plenty of batteries because the Torquedo batteries are proprietary and only 29 amps. So it's not like you can just throw on, you know, we obviously use the X2s for battering, powering GoPros and in my Tacoma, but Torquedo, you got to use the proprietaries in there. You know, you can't just have like 200 amp hours or 125 to get you through. You have to have several so thank you guys so much for letting me borrow those i mean so much thought like you're saying had to go into like you know pulling that this whole thing off and um i'm just so so grateful that it happened so i'm pumped for you man hey, it was really Thanks, cool buddy. to see you win especially you doing your style yeah, um, yeah it's cool especially in the current state of the industry it's cool to see it being won that way uh and i'm looking forward to you putting out some more content from the, the ways you want. And obviously yeah, you guys will have to check out the full and in depth of the day to day, each tournament day. Cause it was pretty, this was pretty high level, but kayak fishing weekly with Justin on Thursday, um, yeah. was having drew on and they're going to have the full in depth, um, from <laughs> practice to research. Yeah. To tournament I'll pull day. up some more videos. So look forward to that more <laughs> videos and more pictures, <laughs> more pictures of some of the fish I caught pre fishing, which is what clued me in. Um, and before I leave, I do also want to say thanks to, or congratulations to Guillermo Gonzalez, second mm -hmm. place, dude, one of the best in the sport. I mean, just the, one of the goats. And I said my, in my post, I said, you know, when you beat this guy, it means you've done something like significant. Amen. And then yep. when you lose to that guy, when he has won, he's won national championship, lots of other events. When you lose to him, you're happy for the guy because he's such he wins with such class and he loses with such class. So huge shout out to Guillermo and Bennett uh, for third place as well. I mean, young angler coming from, you know, North Carolina, I believe it was, he won the North Carolina state championship, you know, watch out for him. So I wanted to give those guys a little shout out and everybody else in the top 10. I mean, the guys from California, like everybody uh, that was in that top 10, it, it was a really, really good group of guys. They had a lot of fun with me backstage and I was super, super nervous and they were freaking me out. Uh, Cause I was asking them, Hey, how was your bite in the afternoon? You know, just trying to fish to see if anyone called <laughs> up and they're like, dude, it was fire. I mean, a couple of guys from California, like it was fire, man. I'm like, Oh God, you're making me like want to go throw up. Cause I, you know, I didn't know until they actually announced it if I'd won or not. But, um, uh, I had a feeling Guillermo didn't call up just cause, uh, people were kind of insinuating, uh, that he didn't, but you still don't know until they call your name. So, but anyway, I want to give those guys all a shout out because these are the best anglers in, in our sport that make it to that event. So um, they deserve to be recognized and they're not there by accident at all. So yeah, Bailey, well, we're going to see you there, man. You qualified. Are you going to yeah, fish it or are you too, that too busy with work? Oh, work, work will, 
we'll work in the event for that. Mm. We'll step aside. That's what I thought. You gotta go all out. Yeah, you but, qualify. Um, so. You requalify with a win, right? So like like the classic itself. I think I think I yeah I think I'm qualified just for winning. You should just so. text Steve and be like, Drew's not allowed in next year. Yeah. He's actually requalified. No, I'm just kidding. Let's uh, <laughs> but, no, um, look at hey, but, at the end of the day, a champion's a championship, and if the best of the best aren't in it, then it's not worth winning. That's and no, so if you're not in it, true. I don't then yeah, I don't care. Yeah, don't the, it was this, more of a joke, all right? Like, yeah, that's right. I know maybe <laughs> I'll be passing the, your point though, like because there's people that that think that way that yeah. you know, like, oh man, Drew's in it, we're fishing for second, which is, I mean, it's fairly true, but like at the end of the day, no. if the best aren't in it, then. I mean, do you feel this hundred percent? Like, why? Oh, hundred percent. And, and this championship hasn't even had all of the best anglers until I think this yeah. year. I mean, like Christine and and Guillermo, they weren't in like some of the first couple, and and Jody Queen and Ewing Minor. Some of the some of these guys weren't in there. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. in the last couple, but now it's it's definitely where the best of the best are fishing. And another and Russ Snyder's, of course, um, that was one of the coolest things. Is Russ Snyder real close? And for him to be able to hand the trophy to me, uh, that was that was awesome, man. Like, just so cool. And so, you know, I'd love to hand the trophy. I, I'd love to win the trophy again, but I'd be so thrilled to hand the trophy off to any of these the anglers in our sport that are representing us real well. Like you, Bailey, you know, your Guillermo's, Christine's, Russ's, Jody Queen's, all, all, the, all those folks that are doing such a good job out there. I mean, but some, sometimes it's like you – New new blood comes in and wins it, and and they're not a name until they're a name. If that makes sense, you know what I mean. If, if somebody we haven't really seen as much on the national stage and heard of, well, that's that's awesome too because they get to start building a legacy and and sort of a brand that we can kind of follow along, and and that's awesome too. So we will see what it. happens next year. It, it's going to be who knows where. I mean, we know that the the elites are on uh, classics Ray on Robert. Ray, yeah, Ray Roberts, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to do Possum like Kingdom again around yeah. that area that you could be on. Yep, there's a plethora of, of options. You got people are talking Texoma, they're talking the Trinity River system there with the what is it, Lake Worth? And it, like I think KBF Gosh. had an event there one time that was Trinity River, Lake Worth, and Eagle. Is it Eagle Mountain? Yeah. If it's Trinity, we should just hand it over to Guillermo already. Just be like he is a hammer, a hammer on that area for sure. But him and Jody Queen, I mean, they had like I think Jody had 109 inches and Guillermo beat him with like 110 or 111 at a tournament there for KBF. Um, there's also some lakes like Lake Athens or Lake Palestine. There's, I, mean, I don't think we're going to go to Possum Kingdom again. If I had to put money on, I would say we'll give it a break just because we're going there again this year. We've already had a championship there when it was on Ray Roberts. I think, I think what's cool about what we do is we get to go to different lakes that are around the classic. We get to move it because they always kind of go back to some of the same lakes for the classic. Is so. Louisville close to that? Louisville is very close, and I know. Oh, no. <laughs> that, yeah, well, I know here's that. The thing. Here's the yeah. thing, Andy. The very yeah, Andy. first. Uh, championship right up there that orange flag what was that mm -hmm. possum kingdom yeah. but originally it was set to lewisville was and set. enough people complained about it being at lewisville that they changed it oh the yeah other is that you can't complain it's going to be lewisville just why? well what well i don't know they also moved it to june so it was going to be a zoo with party boats and jet skis because yeah. that's the busiest lake in like dallas mm -hmm. fort worth area so that's another reason why they they moved it but i mean if it's lewisville it's going to be uh you might as well just be like the U S open, you know, 12 inch high rough and greens that are running so fast. You, you put it off the green. It's going to be that challenging of a venue to catch five decent fish for two days in a row. That's, that's not yeah. easy, but at least it would be March where there's not tons of party boats and stuff like that going on at that point yet. But I hope it's not, I hope we can go to one of the other lakes we mentioned. People have talked possibly Lake fork. I feel like that's just a little too far slash, we just go there a lot. I think the championship would be cool if it's somewhere kind of new and different that we just we haven't seen. We all get to kind of explore it. So for the first time, yeah, so. well, we're gonna find out. That's yep. for dang sure. When do they yeah. announce that? Great question. Maybe two weeks before. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. It sounds about right. No. I bet you it announces um, sometime in like just a, a month or two. I don't think it's. I don't yeah, think it's too long. There'd be an off limits for that event, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting, so. though. But, Drew, congrats, buddy. I'm looking congrats. forward to listening to the full download and full scoop with Justin over at Kayak Fishing Weekly. Um, looking forward to that show. And, man, I'm, again, I'm just I'm pumped for you. Ready yeah, thanks, guys. You guys won. I appreciate all the support, man. I really do. It, it means the world to me. And uh, I'm still going to keep trying my hardest. But uh, 
it does feel like something's changed, like the weight's kind of been lifted and, and kind of die a happy man, so to speak. Um, but I'm still going to be, you know, out there trying my hardest. And You know, it's better than one. Two. What? Yes, that's true. <laughs> Two. And then, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see Love how it. that goes. But uh, yeah. thanks for having me, fellas. Enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you guys all for uh, tuning yeah, in sure. and watching live. All the fans out there and all the support, all the messages. Appreciate Heck it, yeah, buddy. We appreciate yeah. you, and uh, we'll be talking to you real soon, Drew. All right, later. Bye. See you, bro. See you. Well, there you have it, folks. The uh, Bassmaster Kayak Champion uh, this year that's on Ten Killer. Uh, Do it his way. Not no shocker there. You're not going to change Drew one way or another on how he can, how he's going to fish. Um, but actually, he did. You know, speaking of Oklahoma, won Grand Lake last year in a regular season event. Um, so it's the man can just straight up close, and that's what's what's cool about him. And he does it his own way. So great episode, Andy, with Adam Rasmussen, and of course our yeah. pal Mr. Drew Gregory. Uh, make sure you guys go follow them both down in the link below to link to their socials as well as all the baits that we talked about from Adam as well as the baits that Drew was throwing. Uh, we link down below to Omnia Fishing. Make sure you guys use code Series10 if you are going to get them and save some money on it. Uh, but Omnia actually did just post the link to all the Bassmaster Classic releases. Uh, so you want to see all the stuff that was released at the expo, you can go check it out there. Um, but beyond that, we have some cool stuff coming up next week. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the show, we have the college winners, um, Tyler Corey and Scott Sledge from Montevallo, uh, joining us for that. Uh, we might have some big stuff that we're giving away. Um, so make sure you want to tune in for that so you can hear how to enter um, because it's, it's stuff everybody can use, and you're going to have your own pick. Uh, the winner will be able to pick out their specific uh, item that they like. Um, and then... The guest for next week, you guys will have to wait and tune into the Serious Angler social um, to uh, to figure out figure out who it's going to be. But it's uh, it's going to be a pretty big guest. I'm excited for it. We're trying to confirm the last minute logistics on getting them on. Um, but make sure you guys go check out um, our Instagram page if you're not following us yet. We are getting very close to 10,000, and it'd be super cool if we could hit that mark. Um, appreciate everybody that has been following throughout classic week. We try to do our best social wise and, uh, our presence at these shows are only going to get bigger year after year. We have some big plants, like you mentioned earlier for Texas. I'm really excited for that, but Andy, great show. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to tell the folks for next week, but, uh, uh, the lure labs have been absolutely killer. So uh, props to that. What, what is coming up for the Saturday? They can look forward to. So this Saturday we have Jake Maddox joining us, and we're talking the Shimano jerkbaits, the World Flash Minnow and Diver, and what makes them different and kind of set them apart from the normal crowded jerkbaits that we see everyone throwing on basically everyday basis, and some tips and tricks and when you should throw them to catch more bass. So it's gonna be a good episode. Diving into that flash boost. Is that yeah. the text called flash boost? Flash boost. There's actually three D. <laughs> three different texts that are specifically in that bait, which is really cool the way they designed it. So, and some hints at some Shimano baits that are coming. So, oh. yeah. Oh, all righty then. Well, all right, folks, make sure you guys check that out on the lure lab. Um, has his own YouTube channel as well. All of our shows in the network are down below in these show notes for you guys to go check out. Um, but if you can for serious angler, um, go give us a rating and review. We do have those stickers coming for folks that have sent us screenshots uh, of that. We have not forgotten about you. I promise we're just a little bit delayed with all the travel. Mm -hmm. um, we have those um, on order. Uh, so, but if you guys have not heard, we are going to, uh, if you do leave us a rating review, send us a screenshot that you left a review and we'll send you some serious angler and some, some of our show network stickers that you guys can rock, but um, more chances of that coming with the giveaway next week. Mm -hmm. uh, Folks, appreciate you guys, and we'll see y'all next week. Actually, wait. Next week is Harris Chain Week, so we'll have Fantasy Fishing Monday. Oh, man, that's exciting. Big old turnaround. So, yeah, Fantasy Fishing Monday. I didn't realize it was coming that fast. I thought we had a couple weeks. Let me double check. Jeez. I am not very smart, so let me just make sure. No, I'm you might be right. That. Yeah. Wait, no, wait. I think I'm talking out of my ass. Oh, let's look. I think it's three weeks. Tell me in the comments. Am I, am I wrong here? I'm looking it up, but I'm um, upcoming tournament. Uh, 
I think I'm wrong. Right. Oh, almost there. Why is my camera not up to date? Eleven through the fourteenth, so the week after. Okay, I'm a turd. Never mind. Ignore me. <laughs> no worries. Monday would be uh, the Monday after Easter, so Easter is Sunday night. All right. Well, scrap that whole last minute of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies on that. We won't see you Monday. We will see you next Tuesday night. Y'all are amazing. Appreciate you. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank <laughs> you.